So, uh, welcome, Les. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming out. Um, <laughs> Les is the gracious uh, supplier of the camera, and uh, we've had a chat before, but the, the recording didn't work out so well. So I was flapping my gums, and nothing <laughs> came out. Can I um, so you know the routine. Uh, is there something you'd like to talk about today that we can? I think the question you asked me the first time was, "Do I have any strongly held beliefs?" Yes. <laughs> Okay, so <clears throat> I'm sure I'll try and cover our, everything I said the first time, probably not the same with exact words, but here goes. Yeah, yeah I do have a strongly held belief. Um, I really, I don't believe that I really exist. Okay. Like, I mean, I know this exists, right? I, I, I know that. But who's talking to you? That's what I'm talking about. Okay, so I'm talking about and, and just using the word I causes at some lower level in me a little bit of angst because I really don't subscribe to I okay. as a real thing. What do you think it's a manifestation of then? Um, I'm not sure if manifestation is the right word. Okay. Um, I, 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 the way I have come to this uh, way of looking at the world is through a certain amount of personal reflection and observation of myself and others, and uh, a large part that made me, a large thing, a thing that made me kind of feel that this was an idea that had some real reality to it and worth pursuing was the work of Dr. Michael Gazaniga. And, uh, he, he, um, amongst researchers out there in the world on neurology, he had a unique opportunity, which they may not have again, in that he got to work with a special cohort of patients who had a treatment that we just don't do anymore, and that treatment is called a commiserotomy. Commiserotomy, what does that mean? Okay. So, when you have seizures, like epileptic fit, grand mal seizures, uh, when they finally got around to being able to look at readings of the EEGs that people mm -hmm. were undergoing this, the, the feeling they got was it was like a huge electrical storm that just bounced around in the head and just, mm -hmm. they, they tried various mechanisms to make it stop, right. and it was varying degrees of failure. So. Right. Somebody had the idea of cutting the link between the two halves of your brain. Your, mm -hmm. your brain is divided, your, the hot upper levels of your brain are divided into a left and right. A lot of people know that. Mm -hmm. And there is a bundle of nerves that connect those two halves. It's called the corpus callosum. Mm -hmm. And if you cut that, that's <clears> called <throat> a commiserotomy. Mm -hmm. And the thinking was that if they cut that, then there wouldn't be the whole head involved in this electrical storm because they break the connection between the halves. Whether or not that really worked, I couldn't tell you. But what it did create was it created a, I can't remember how many patients were actually done, this had done to them, less than, a, less than three dozen, I think. Uh, but those patients became unique um, in the sense that we have, through a lot of study, learned that certain of our functions, certain of our abilities, reside in one side over the other side. Mm -hmm. So, your speech centers, how you talk, learn that to talk and everything else, that's in the left side of your brain. Mm -hmm. um, Predominant, your, predominantly. Predominantly, yeah, exactly. Um, your artistic and, and that, that sort of feeling yeah. part of your brain, that's more on the right-hand side yeah. of your brain. So I, I know some of the outcomes was like, you know, they, they could look at a, pic, a, a picture of a pen, but they couldn't write down pen. Well, in a there sense, was it, a wasn't just a, it wasn't a signal picture. What they were able to do with these patients was simple. Uh, they could put a partition between their two eyes and they could mm -hmm. show one picture to one side of the brain because your eye on this side actually communicates with that side of your brain mm -hmm. and the eye on this side communicates with that side of the brain. So if you show different pictures to the two sides and then you ask the person, what did you see? 
Well, the speech comes from this side, mm -hmm. so they will describe to you what this eye saw. Yeah. And if you ask them to draw it, well, it gets even more confusing because your left and right hands are also switched from side to side. This side is controlled by that side of the brain and vice versa. Some people are lefties and some people are rights. But if you were to give somebody a drawing of a, a, a chicken and an orange, so the chicken is over here and this side sees it and the orange is over there, and you ask them, what did you see? They'll say chicken. And they say, oh, if you don't ask them that question, if you ask them, please, could you pick up one of these colored pens mm -hmm. and draw what you saw with your left hand. So you give them that and their left hand draws something and mm -hmm. then you ask them to tell you what it is they see there in front of them. What happens is the side of the brain that's talking to you verbally mm -hmm. doesn't really know what it's looking at because it didn't see what that side of the brain drew. Right. And so, 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 but how yeah. does this get to the idea that you don't exist? Okay, so what his research showed him that was that uh, two basic tenets here. One is, even though you don't know what that is, because you drew it, you saw your hand draw it and everything else, right? At, at some level, you know that that came from you. So what what's going on there is that people are continuously making up their own story about what it is they're doing, what mm -hmm. they're saying, how they're feeling, as to why it is, even if that part of their brain that is thinking or talking doesn't really have any connection with what happened there. And that idea that you're making up explanations about reality that you don't understand all the time without even realizing you're doing it, that's, that fits the basic definition of um, somebody who is psychotic. Okay. So at a basic level, all of us, you included, are psychotic all the time. It's just our natural operating procedure. That's the one thing. The other thing is that his research showed that there isn't just one of us in here. There are sub processes. I mean, I have a computer background, so I might use terminology that comes from the computer field. Mm -hmm. But essentially, there are a lot of subversions of you running all the time, taking care of various things uh, that you don't actually have to think about doing. Mm -hmm. So, from my own personal observation, I've developed the idea of the driver, right? So, here's simple. Whenever you learn how to do something, in the beginning, you're literally thinking about everything you do. You, you think about putting your hands on the car, and when the person teaching you how to drive says, oh, um, why don't you reach over and change the radio station? What happens is you go, oh, I gotta go over there, and you do that, and the car actually moves in that direction, because your whole focus is on moving something, your hand, to that and you tend to move this way. Or why don't you turn on a turn signal to turn left? You turn on a turn signal to turn left, but because you, this hand is actually doing something like that, the car actually drifts over to the left, even though you haven't reached the turn yet. But eventually, all these things become automatic. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to think about mm -hmm. them. Everybody who's been a driver for a long time has had the experience I'm gonna describe here, and that is, you have to go somewhere, whether it's work or appointment or whatever, you get in your car at home and then you get to where you're going and it dawns on you that you can't remember anything about the trip you just took. Yet you navigated streets, traffic lights, obstructions, people, all kinds of things. You might have even stopped at a convenience store to get some coffee or something and it's all gone. As if it wasn't happening. Why? Because your mind was occupied with thinking about other things. Mm -hmm. And now, in legal definition, that's called undue care and attention. If you had an accident and sure. you described it that way, that's what they'd hit you, you with. You wouldn't want to report that. Exactly. But that's what goes on almost all the time to right. all of us. So, because you have a driver inside you. Mm. 
Now, so I'm reading this interesting book by Daniel Dennett called The Consciousness Explained. And right. he talks about this. He's actually trying to toss away this whole idea that there's a driver. Oh, they okay. They call that the Cartesian theater. Okay. Um, where, you know, stuff is happening to the sole audience member inside somewhere in our brain. Right. He's yeah. trying to toss that whole thing out. Right. He calls it the multiple, multiple drafts theory. Where multiple multiple drafts, drafts drafts okay so that uh, you know things are are being processed like si lots of simultaneous yep. things yep. and that they build on each other to form whatever it is we call ourselves being conscious of right yeah yeah so that's taking away the driver I can tell well, so, Wait, so when you well, I don't, I, no, I don't how is it taking away the driver well, I'm because curious. because there are so many, as you said, there are, there are subroutines that are being run right. In, right. inside this process, and that those collectively become what is consciousness. Consciousness is not me inside my brain. Mm -hmm. Consciousness is like an emergent property of okay, subroutines, so right? When you say take away the driver, you're talking about me being a driver, and I'm not actually saying me being a driver. I'm saying that when you have achieved automaticity on some activity. You've got a version of you inside that is able to do that without you actually consciously thinking about it. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you actually consciously think about it, you're worse at whatever it is that you have now become automatic at. Sure. Just think about this. The next time you're driving down the highway and you're going at high speed and you have to negotiate bends and stuff like that, if, if you have just been doing that and it hasn't been a, a problem and you start to actually think about everything you do, consciously think about it, you're going to find that you don't drive as well as you did. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you how we end up this way. It, like I, my theory of how we come to be like this, it, 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 I mean, I, I'm not a biologist, I, I really don't have any laboratory experiments to back this up, but I look at it this way, it's nice and simple. Back in the evolution of what became us, what became all animals, uh, at some point you have the evolution of a neuro neurological system in there. And that neurological system basically processes information. In the beginning it was simple things like, oh, there's a chemical signature of something that I like to consume or I, I, I eat in this direction, so I'll move my flagella this way. And, and then that doesn't even come to rise to the level of consciousness of some amoeba sure. thinking, I have to do this. It just that's what the neurons end up processing and mm. creating signals to move flagella here and not on their, that side, or move them in a different pattern. Whatever works takes thousands or millions of years to work it out. But eventually that becomes a nerve bundle that can remember things, it has a memory. Mm -hmm. So when you, it encounters a chemical signature, it remembers something about that and it responds in a way that that memory triggers okay sure so association building associations that's right that. so as we become more and more complex tr creatures mm -hmm. right the the landscape around us we also create more sensory organs so at some point we get to hear we get to see or at yeah. least sense light etc cetera, etc cetera. and what happens is the memory and the senses and the growing complex of neurology allows that creature to, in a sense, create a model internally of the world and work with that model because you don't actually see colors and light, you don't hear sounds. What you, if you think you exist, what you up here actually experience is the result of processed sensory information mediated by processes within your head and sure. then presented to you as a completely different report of what's going on. Sure. So it's like the um, it Socrates or Aristotle had the vats with brains and vats yeah, looking at shadow play yeah. on, on the wall. Uh, in a sense, that's what our brains and our senses are. Mm -hmm. Okay, so get this. At some point down the road, you have this um, bifurcation of, of species in animals where some animals eat vegetables and other animals meet other animals, predators and prey. So. What happens, what I feel happens at that point, is you end up with an animal that is much better at surviving and feeding itself and passing on its genes and everything else because it survived than others because their neural processing has allowed them to not only make models of the world, they've made a model of 
how a uh, prey animal behaves. Sure. And when they do that, think about this. What you've got now is you've got a <clears throat> processing unit up here that is able to not only have a model of the world, but it's able to have a model of another processing unit living in another being somewhere out there that it wants to kill and eat. Now that's now we're getting into really esoteric computing. Like, like once you get to the point of being able to actually come up with things like communication and the intelligence that we have, um, at some point in there, you are passing ideas, abstract concepts about the world to others. Okay, mm -hmm. so now there's this whole thing of when you're born, baby is born and it has more neurology than it's ever going to have in its life and that first year and a year and a half is a whole making sense of all the world and wiring itself up to be able to process that information and as it does that making this model of the world i talk about mm -hmm. one of the things it's doing is it's looking at the two consistent other human beings in its world in the typical nuclear family i'm not saying that we're all like this and that's the parents mm -hmm. and it learns how to be a human being by being exposed to the parents it has and as it does that it's building in a sense a model of that parent as it learns and it grows and it's exposed more and more to that parent yeah okay. then they have a, an internalized version of mom an internalized version of dad an internalized version of uncle billy or whatever it is and and think about that that means that at some point down the road after dad has gone off out of your life or mom has gone off out of your life you've gone out into the world and you encounter something that they might have actually helped instruct you on but they're not there and they didn't actually teach you that thing you might actually when you're especially a teenager or a young adult go i wonder what dad would do in this situation i wonder how dad, what mom would do in this situation you might actually hear that voice in their head mom's voice or dad's voice and they would in a sense give you a take on how they would deal with that and the older you get the more that voice sounds like your voice and you've internalized all that and at some point halfway through your life you take for granted so many things that you've learned as you go that you always knew and you've forgotten where you knew them and who taught them to you and you don't realize that a lot of those little voices that you hear in your head they aren't necessarily a voice from you they're a voice from something you absorbed along the way so how do we get to many people in the head? Well, actually, how do we get this non-existence thing? Okay, so, Gazanaga is showing that at a neurological level, he can show you empirically in the lab that there are many subroutines, as you would call them, sub-processes going on. My belief in the hum human evolution or the development of human beings goes like this. So you're growing, you are a baby, you get to a certain age, at that certain age you're actually interacting with the world, you're not just lying there and being subjected to changes, but you can crawl, then you can walk, okay. then you can touch and feel and eventually you can talk. Okay, so there's a whole stage of your life that comes to a certain termination when you first go to school. The, the whole world changes in some sense. You go to school, you're exposed to a teacher, you're maybe a teacher's aide as well, other kids in the class, and you go through school and what happens is, let's say you're in preschool, you're in preschool for a year or two, and then all of a sudden you're in kindergarten. Your environment has changed, so the person that you were at that point, because it's such an abrupt change, you really haven't changed into a new person. In a sense, what happened is that person you were before the change happened is still in there somewhere and then you go to kindergarten and you're in kindergarten for a year and then you go to the primary school and wow it's a completely different environment and then for five or six years depending on what school you go to and what school system you're in you are slowly becoming a more mature person within that system and you get to the point where you're the senior class in that system and then all of a sudden bang you're in a new school you're at the bottom of the ladder you have a whole new bunch of things okay what so happens to that person you were when you were in primary school have they gone do you really like the way i look at it is this as you go through life you have periods of time where you are a certain person and then you come to an abrupt change and you you literally have a different set of parameters to live within and who you are changes but that person that you were is still in there somewhere. I'm not talking about uh, memories of you. I'm talking about an actual version of you. And here's an example of why I think that works. You can think about this 
and I can't say this is a scientific experiment, but the way I think this whole Dennett's idea of subprocesses and everything else mm -hmm. works into this, yeah. okay? So when I'm 65, you're in your 60s, I think, and... and no. Oh, okay, so <clears throat> when you're an adult and you've got a whole bunch of views inside, let's take the example of, I like this one. brings into play the best version of you that knows how to deal with this situation. So in the case of John here, who's now 42 or 45 or whatever, hasn't dated and hasn't been in the dating scene or had to do any of this since he was a teenager. But that teenager, like I said, is kind of like, came to a kind of screeching halt with the marriage and the end of high school and stuff. So what happens is the system brings the teenager into the fore and the teenager starts reacting to these stimulus, the, the signals coming to them. And pretty soon the teenager inside John is making promises or making commitments to this person that he's in front of that maybe he can or maybe he can't live up to, but he's now finding himself doing things that he hasn't done in 25 years okay. and it's not really him that's doing them but he's in there of course he thinks he's the only one in there and so he's going oh wow I haven't lost it right well no you don't have it the 18 or the 17 or the 16 year old version of you has it and that's who's running your body right now and making the winks and the smiles and everything else and you just think it's you like, okay. That's the way I look at it. Like okay. it's not just what was a driver. The, what's the practical implication on how how you live life? What where is the practical implications of that belief? Okay, so there is no you, but let's go with that. Um, researchers who study, especially for marketing, um, how people make decisions for buying things, choices in their life mm -hmm. for all kinds of things. What they have learned is that. There are lots of processes going on at a subliminal, subconscious, whatever you want to call it, level that are involved in steering your choice okay. that you're not even aware of. Most people have no idea. If you ask the top experts in marketing cars, what is the primal thing in car advertising and marketing? They'll tell you a nice thing. The guru, I remember watching the 60 Minutes thing on 25, 30 years ago, and, and the guru of all these guys, they talked to him and they asked him, and he says, well, it's sex. Sex sells. That's what it is. 
all the rest of it is trying to dress it up to get that thing, that message to push the sex button inside you somewhere. So you then are flooded with the emotions that are associated with that thing in your life. And if you feel good about sex, you'll feel good about whatever that car is or truck is that had a message that made you feel sexy. It's basically simple. All these things going on inside you, all these drives that you have, all these, I call them just subversions of you. My, my analogy for this is nice and simple. We're a bus, there's a guy up front driving, or a girl, they think they're the only one in the bus, but they don't realize that they don't really exist. They are a synthesized thing that actually represents the intertwined wants, desires, fears, everything else of everybody behind them that they don't even realize are there, that they have been throughout their lives, that they've grown throughout their lives. And some of those things have voices and think and feelings and some of them, like my driver idea, don't have to do any of that stuff. They just have to drive the car, right? They pilot the airplane walk down the street, dance, whatever it is that those, those, like, we are the most amazing computers that has ever been evolved. And gee whiz, you know, like, uh, all the research that I've heard of backs me up on this. Uh, in, the, in that, you know, there's not a single you in here. There's not a single me in here. Mm. There's a feeling that there is. Have you ever heard of Alien Hand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, we had talked about that. Yeah, but they may, may not have. Right, of course. Encapsulating Alien Hand very simply. If you ever watched Doctor Strangelove, you saw Alien Hand when the guy's arm kept going up. Oh, my sure! And he tried to get it down. Alien Hand is where one of your hands all of a sudden behaves as if some alien is controlling it, and often the alien is inimical to you, so the hand actually attacks you, physically attacks you, and people who suffer from Alien Hand have to have that hand restrained, otherwise it will attack them. Like, it will scratch them, it will punch them and everything else. And what's going on there? I mean, the hand is still attached to you, and obviously everything the hand does has to come from in here somewhere. If you're not controlling it, who is? And um, of course, if you believe in religion and demons and everything else, you have an out in this argument. I can't persuade you, but if you if you're thinking on a science and neurological level, if this thing now is controlled by something else, but it's controlled from something in here, mm -hmm. what is that something else? I mean, really, you know, like what is that something else? And where does it come from? Multiple personality disorders, or whatever the technical term is. Uh, I have no problem seeing that as a reality, because think about it. You have a situation where, quite often what I've heard is, you have a situation where the person's life is, the, the stress on them at that point is so unbearable that they cannot deal with it, so they abdicate, and the system creates somebody who can on the spot, create somebody who can. Maybe that somebody was back in the in them somewhere, but now all of a sudden there's a different them that can take the pain, take the hit, deal with it or whatever, right? And now you've got a you and another you, right? Like, it, it gets confusing dealing with the idea that, well, there could be more than one of you in that physical body yeah. there is only one up well this is i mean you know so certainly you know i think we're we can almost i think agree on this idea that like i i don't have a sense that um there's one person the driver in the driver's seat that's running the show that's because you're psychotic <laughs> <laughs> there you go but but I, I guess you know when you because initially you said you believe that we don't exist. Well, something exists. Well, no, obviously something exists. Yeah, so I, I, I think that was it, just trying to work through I should what exactly I should, you meant I should by redefine that. what I said statement. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, my, the belief that lives in me is that the definition of what I is is flawed right. completely. It's, gotcha. It's... It's like 
we used to have an idea of how the world worked called an empirical view of the world and then along came quantum mechanics and what quantum mechanics shows us is that at the fundamental levels the world is far stranger than our imagination mm. literally far stranger than our imagination so much so that that I've, Niels Bohr apparently, or somebody in the early days said, if you think you understand it, you don't understand it. Um, and it's, I think that, that, very that's like. what's going on in here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Anyway. yeah, that was very cool. Uh, maybe I'm crazy. I'll admit to being psychotic the same way everybody <laughs> else is. Right on. Thanks, Les. Okay. Yeah. And you know what? My definition for crackpot, psychoceramic. <laughs> okay. Psycho ceramic. Uh, hey, thanks, guys. Hey there. Um, I just wanted to comment briefly on uh, the discussion I had with Les. Um, I know I didn't ask a lot of questions because we had actually talked about that particular subject before, and I found it actually pretty intriguing uh, because it's following some some interest that I have uh, on consciousness. So I think um, that Les has some pretty interesting ideas on it that perhaps, you know, could be uh, massaged a little bit um, and so that it's, so that it's clear. And I, I think that's where we were trying to get to. So um, upon reflection and uh, going through the video with him and I talking. I'm going to sit down with uh, Les again and we are going to uh, continue that conversation. Um, perhaps, uh, certainly when I finished uh, Daniel Dennett's uh, book uh, called uh, Consciousness Explained, which is uh, just fascinating reading. Um, so yeah, so I will be back. Okay, thanks.